Well, shall we go ahead and uh, get started this evening? First of all, I want to say always thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be here with you. Um, I hope you've gotten uh, the listening guide from the back table. We're going to be working off of that tonight. And before we get started, I thought I would just share a little bit about what we're going to be doing tonight. And I apologize up front, straight off. We don't have any fill in the blanks, but there's lots of blank. So you can just fill in whatever you want to, wherever you want to. But each slide that we'll be looking at tonight does have a heading and the passages of scripture that we're gonna be reading with that heading so that you'll be able to, to follow where we've been and where we're going. Um, th for our Wednesday nights that we've been uh, meeting together since September, we've been tracking through the scripture, looking at the redemptive plan of God from Genesis to Jesus. And as we begin to wrap up, not just our uh, weeks and months together this calendar year, but also as we begin to kind of uh, wrap up our time in the Old Testament, tonight we're going to be looking at some of the same points that we've been looking at each week, which have been uh, the questions to think about while you're reading the Bible, and also the, very, the definitions that we've been looking for in the redemptive plan that Jesus has, um, the, actually that God has revealed to us through the Holy Spirit throughout the Old Testament. And the uh, points that I have bolded are the ones that we're going to be really looking at tonight. And I may not be pointing to them specifically, but I want you to just have your ears and heart open as we go through the next hour as we're looking about it. Because as we go through the passages of Scripture that we're going to be looking at tonight, uh, we, we need to remember, of course, that we're still in the Old Testament, which means we're dealing still with the Old Covenant, which really is inclusive of the promise made to Eve that through her seed, the serpent would be crushed. We also know that we've gone through the Abrahamic covenant, which of course promised that through the seed of Abraham, all of the nations would be blessed, as well as the promise that God made to Abraham's descendants for the land and a nation. We're still under that covenant as we look at the passages of scripture tonight. And then we add to that the Mosaic covenant, which of course gave us the law as God gave his people the standard whereby God's holy people would live in relationship with God. God gave the law knowing, of course, that people would not be able to keep the law. God's standard was be holy as I am holy, but the law teaches us that we cannot be holy. And so along with the law under the Mosaic Covenant, God gave the means whereby atonement could be achieved for God's, uh, for God's people through the sacrificial system, through a priesthood, at the tabernacle, at the brazen altar, pointing, of course, to the only one who would be able to live holy as God is holy, thereby providing the adequate substitute sacrifice for our sins so that no longer would we have just atonement, which is covering for our sins, but we would be able to move into a place called re of redemption, whereby our sin would be removed as far as the east is from the west because of the sufficient sacrifice of Christ. And then we moved into the Davidic covenant, which added another layer to all of the two previous covenants, promising that there would be, through the royal line of David, a descendant who would sit for eternity on the throne of David. So now we're looking for a seed who will crush the serpent. We're looking for a perfect sacrifice who would provide uh, uh, his blood sacrifice that would not only cover our sins, but remove our sins. And then we're looking for a royal descendant who will serve both as king, priest, and prophet. And as we go into the passages of scripture tonight, we're going to see how all of those begin to to really coalesce as we're looking forward to the end of the old covenant, anticipating the new covenant, the one who will come, who will be a fulfillment of all of the previous promises. So while you're reading the Bible and we read it tonight, I want us to look at what, does, what do these passages of scripture, what are these books that we're going to be looking at tonight, what do they tell us about God? And then um, on the immediate... <laughs> uh, flip side of what does scripture tell us about God is what does it tell us 
about how people respond to God. Those are going to be the two um, major points that we're going to be looking at tonight. And then in, as we look at the definitions, we've already talked about covenant. Worship we have been defining since September as trusting God by following what his covenant says. But then the disobedience, and that's what we're going to look at tonight really in depth, is what is disobedience? How is that defined? It's trusting something other than God to provide what is needed and worshiping God in ways he did not direct. As we go into um, our study tonight, we are going to be looking at how man given all of the, and especially, of course, the nation of Israel, but not exclusively the nation of Israel. Because if we get into the, uh, really into the rut of always talking about them and their failures, we lose sight of the fact that we are just like them. And Israel had an opportunity to be in a very privileged place as the people chosen and called by God to be his nation of witnesses, his nation of priests to the, to the world, to the nations of the world, so that they too could know the God of Abraham through the blessing that Israel would be to the world. We know that they were not able to accomplish that. We're going to see that as we go into our study tonight. Let's join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of your spirit. We thank you for the ever-present Holy Spirit that is our teacher and our guide. I thank you for the word that you've given us so that we can um, see you more clearly. And Father, I thank you so much that because of what Christ has done for us, when we see you in your holiness and your righteousness, we cannot but know that we are sinners and we need a Savior. Father, I thank you that we can call upon the name of your only beloved Son, who gave us the gift of salvation because of his sacrificial death on our behalf. And tonight, Father, I pray that your spirit would be our teacher. I pray, Father, that I would be one of few words tonight. But, Father, that instead we would see your eternal and faithful words. And that you would be our teacher and our guide. And, Father, as we look full in your face, I pray, Father, that we would be more impacted by the grace and the mercy that is ours because of who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to be going into the last grouping of uh, books of the Bible. We have gone through all of the major sections of the Bible. Tonight we're going to start by going into the minor prophets. The minor prophets are the smaller books at the end of the Old Testament, just as we go into the, the New Testament. They're called minor prophets, of course, not because they're minor or have a lesser message to share with us, only because they're shorter, only because they're shorter than the longer prophets that precede them, which we call as major prophets. I want to just in, uh, give you a little bit of background about the uh, minor prophets, and I want to warn you up front that if you're not listening really fast tonight, we're not going to get it all done, which is why I really prayed that I would be a woman of few words tonight. The, the words that we say, I pray, are going to be really um, meaningful. The minor prophets are, interestingly, I did not know this until I studied for you tonight, that in the Hebrew Bible, they are just called the Twelve because there are 12 minor prophets. And so as they're referred to in um, the Hebrew Bible, they are just referred to as the 12. And what we're going to be looking at tonight is Hosea, who begins the, the 12 uh, minor prophets, and we're going to spend time in Jonah. But what I want is to step back and to look at the, the message that's contained both in the minor prophets, in the major prophets, oh, let me see, through all, throughout all of Scripture is that the Holy Spirit, of course, is the inspiration of God's word. He is the one who has inspired the men who hold the pen to write the, uh, the words. It is revealing to us always the heart of God, the character of God. The minor prophets, of course, fit directly into that. So it's important for us to know that the message that we're going to read in any one of the 12 minor prophets is going to be the same message <laughs> that we've read 
up to this point in scripture, which is a reminder of who God is, giving us a clearer and more precise picture of his character and his attributes so that we can know him better. And in the knowing of him better, we see ourselves more clearly. And in the minor prophets, there is a very strong delineation showing us how far we in our sinful uh, nature that we've inherited from Adam, how far that leaves us from the holy character of God and reminds us so specifically of how we need a savior. The minor prophets are gonna be divided up into three different groups. Uh, One group is going to uh, prophesy to specifically the nation of Israel, the ten tribes to the north, and they are going to prophesy about the sinful condition of the ten tribes. And with that, the, the impending judgment will be captivity to come to them through Assyria. So with the, prop, the books we're going to be looking at tonight, um, Hosea and Jonah, in addition to Amos, are really the the books that are uh, at the same time frame to the northern kingdom. In the south, Amos is is ministering at the same time, not Amos, Isaiah is ministering at the same time to the southern kingdom. The next group of, of minor prophets will be ministering to Judah, to Jerusalem. Uh, Isaiah's the one who kind of um, bridges the time between uh, the time that, As- that Assyria is attacking and taking into captivity the northern tribes. Isaiah will be alive during that transition time. But he also, Isaiah also is going to minister to Judah and remind them of their responsibility to live holy lives in repentance. And so the next group of, of uh, prophets in the minor prophets will be talking to Judah and will be prophesying to Judah about their impending Uh, attack and captivity through the hands of Babylon. And we know that as Babylon comes in and takes the the, uh, last remaining vestige of God's people in the Holy Land into captivity to Babylon, that they will stay in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And after that 70-year period of time in Babylon, God will bring his people back to Jerusalem, and that will be the the last few books of the Minor Prophets will be post-exile written to those Jewish people who have come out of captivity in Babylon and are living in Jerusalem. The message to the exiles who have come back to Jerusalem is very much the same message that was given to the um, ten tribes in the north and to Judah. God is a sovereign and holy God. And he not only demands, but he deserves to have the full, wholehearted devotion of his people. And in that wholehearted devotion, there is an expectation that God's people will have a single vision to see and to know their God and to live in accordance with his call upon their lives. So in essence, that is the, um, the message of all of the 12 whom we call minor prophets. If you'll turn to me to Jonah chapter 2, and I'll give you a minute now to maybe uh, put your fingers in both Jonah and um, Hosea. Those are the two books we'll be in tonight. But there's one little passage in Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. It happens to be uh, a verse that's contained in the, the prayer that Jonah prays from the belly of the whale. Um, but I think it speaks, it, it really kind of um, encapsulizes the entire message, not just of the minor prophets, but of God's heart altogether. If you're with me in Jonah chapter 2, verse 8, um, and, and considering Jonah, this is at the time when Jonah is, um, he's run from the call of God to minister to Nineveh. He's been thrown into the raging storm of a sea, and uh, God has provided a whale to swallow him up. And there in the, whale, in the belly of a whale, Jonah confesses and turns to God and uh, makes amazing commitment to fulfill his vows, giving God the praise and the glory that's rightly his as the covenant-making and keeping God that Jonah has known. And in verse 8 of chapter 2, Jonah says, Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. 
And I think with that one verse, we began to, to see not just Jonah's repentant spirit, but we also see and began to, to really get a, a feel for the heart of God who has called his people into covenant relationship, not just to bring them into restoration and reconciliation with himself, but to empower them to live lives that would rightly represent him to a world that does not know him. And Jonah, finally in the belly of a whale, recognizes that those idols are the very things that have kept them from the privilege that is theirs as God's um, holy people. So as we go on tonight, then, I want us to look at the timing of when both, Jerobo, uh, both Jonah and Hosea live. Um, Jonah and Hosea are both going to present their messages to the northern kingdom, to the ten tribes to the north, during the reign of Jeroboam II. And Jeroboam II, uh, we're going to read in Second Kings, a little brief description about Jeroboam's reign. What I want us to know, what I want you to know before we go into it, is that Jeroboam's reign is about 150 years into the divided kingdom. He is Jeroboam the second, the king who initially brought about the divided kingdom after Solomon's death was Jeroboam the first. Jeroboam the first is the one who established in the northern tribes up in Israel the alternative worship sites for the people of the ten tribes in the north. Um, that he built golden calves in Bethel and in Dan so that the Israelite people who were covenant, the covenant people of God were given an alternative substitute to worshiping at the temple, at the brazen altar, where um, the only atonement that would be available for God's people was. And so from the time of Jeroboam the first to Jeroboam the second, there's been a 150 year time span where God's people and the 10 tribes have been worshiping at the golden altars of calves rather than traveling down to Jerusalem to worship God. Let's pick it up then if you have uh, your scriptures, we're going to read in Second Kings chapter 14, verses 23 to 29. And I just want us to get a picture of Jeroboam II, what his reign was like, and, um, and a picture of what 150 years of apostate religion would do and accomplish in the midst of God's holy people in the covenant land of Israel. Uh, chapter 14, 2 Kings, verses 23 to 29. In the fifteenth year of Am Amaziah, Amaziah, son of jo Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned forty-one years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He, Jeroboam the second, was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amity, the prophet of Gath Hefer. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. As for the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did and his military achievements, including how he recovered for Israel both Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, but were not written in the book, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam rested with his ancestors, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him as king. What we're going to find as we move into Hosea and Jonah is that what we have just read in 2 Kings is a brief synopsis of Jeroboam the second's reign, second's reign, is that Jonah, the man whose book we're going to read tonight, has prophesied 
that Jeroboam will be a very successful king, that he will be able to acquire lands that will, in essence, extend the boundaries of Israel to the time that would be matching the time that were the boundaries during Solomon's united kingdom reign. And it's amazing that we look at, and I, I bring this up for two reasons. I want us to understand who Jeroboam II was as a king, because he was very successful militarily. He was very successful um, economically for his people. And under his reign, which was decades long, uh, Israel uh, achieved a high level of economic uh, security and complacency. And all of that had been prophesied by Jonah, that that would be what happens. Um, we're going to see later on in Hosea that there's going to be a, an accusation that the boundaries have been moved during the time of Jeroboam. And we can see that that, that happened. The boundaries moved because Israel was able to acquire land that had been taken uh, from them by the various battles and wars that it had happened after Solomon's death. But the, ac but the um, accusation that God is giving through Hosea is not so much about the physical boundaries that have been moved during Jeroboam's reign as king of Israel, but the spiritual boundaries that were moved. And how God's decreed um, commandments and expectations and call upon his people had been so perverted and so moved that by the time we get to Hosea's timeline, um, God's worship, God's heart, God's um, provision for his people is in jeopardy because the spiritual boundaries have been so farly, so far removed that there's not even a semblance of really recognition into what God intended for the relationship to be with his people. Secondly, I wanted us to see this because I want us to understand that by the time Jonah is able to prophesy this prophecy to Jeroboam, he has probably already been to Nineveh. This is uh, probably post-Nineveh uh, repentance and turning around, which would mean the, the nation of Assyria was a strong world power for up to 800 years, uh, beginning to bring, come to the ascent to the forefront as a world power, just about the time that Rehoboam and Jeroboam began their reigns following Solomon's uh, death. He, during Solomon's reign, Assyria was putting together the semblance of a nation. By the time Jonah gets on the scene and is able to go and to uh, be called by God to go to Nineveh, they have already begun to be very aggressive in their pursuit of the nations around them. We know the story of Jonah. We'll spend a little bit more time with it tonight. But we know that Jonah is reluctant to go to Nineveh because he knows that God is a gracious God who will uh, relent from destruction if people respond to him appropriately. And we will follow uh, the reluctant prophet Jonah's story. But I want us to see that because of most scholars uh, that, that I have read, most scholars that I read have said that during this time frame when Jeroboam was able to move the boundaries of Israel and recapture some of the property, Assyria had reached a zenith of power and then it kind of plateaued. And there was about a generation and a half whereby Jeroboam was able to begin to, to conquer some of Assyria's, prop, some of Assyria's uh, land masses. And that would fit directly in with that generation of repentance in Assyria, that that would have provided a time as God allowed uh, Assyria to be not as aggressive as they had been t normally during that generation and a half. And then Jonah comes back to his people and God encourages him to encourage Israel to take advantage of this time frame of Assyria's uh, change in heart because it's not going to be long lasting. Are, are you following with me? And so as we pick up now and go into the story of Hosea and Jonah, I want you to know we're going to look at Hosea first chronologically, but Hosea is going to minister 
after Jonah has already been to Nineveh, come back to Nineveh, prophesied to Jeroboam. Jeroboam has been successful in his reign as king. And in that successful reign as king, complacency and uh, idol worship and all of the substitutions that have been, taken, have been taken place in the hearts and lives of the people of God in the northern ten tribes results in the message that Hosea is going to bring to them. Are you following with me? Are you kind of excited to kind of understand and put this all together? Because what I want us to see is that Hosea and, and Jonah are both going to give us two pictures of the character of our God that are um, priceless. They are important for us to begin to understand because in the ministry of Jonah, in the ministry of Hosea, we see the heart of God in ways that really should take our breath away. We will see in Hosea, and of course, most of us are familiar with, in general, the stories of Hosea and Jonah. We'll go into them a little bit more in depth in a minute. But just for now, I want us to just get an overall picture. First of all, I want us to agree together. Are we agreeing together? You don't know what yet. <laughs> We're going to agree together that we know Israel has become wicked and filled with idolatry. And as a result of that, the debauchery and the wickedness and the abuses are rampant in the country. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the particulars of their sin. I just want us to agree that they have reached what Amos says for three or maybe four sins. <laughs> they have reached the the limit, the tipping over place of sin in their lives. And it's not just because of their personal choices in their homes and in their cities and in their nation, but in their heart as they have pulled further and further and further away from God. So in Hosea, we are going to see through his story that God is leaving for Hosea, for the 10 tribes to the north of Israel, for Judah, and ultimately for you and I. In a living object lesson of God's loving kindness and how he loves and loves and loves and he reaches out and he reaches out and he reaches out to draw us into a relationship with himself full well knowing who we are and what it's going to cost him to do that we are going to see that love in demonstration as God calls Hosea to do something that is really on the same par, if you will, with what God calls Abraham to do. When Abraham is called by God to offer up his only son on an altar to be sacrificed, we know how God stepped in and said he himself would provide the sacrifice. And Isaac went back down the mountain with his father. The book of Hebrews says, therefore, uh, Abraham saw it as if Isaac had been resurrected. What God is calling Hosea to do in his lifetime is to love a wife with the depths of his heart for his entire life. A wife who will time and time again betray him and turn against him and do everything he can, she can to communicate to him that Hosea is of little value to her. Hosea will provide and provide and provide for her, and she will credit her lovers with that provision. And when we begin to understand the picture that God is giving to us through this real man who lived in real time with a real wife named Gomer and loved her unconditionally time and time again, we begin to understand the heart of God and how it has been his heart since the time he spoke creation, knowing that the people he loved would respond to him in the same way that Gomer responds to Hosea. We will see that loving kindness played out over and over again. And the, the most graphic picture that I could summarize for the book of Hosea is how throughout the book of Hosea, God references the city of Bethel, the place where Jacob... Uh, first encountered God, the angel of God, and saw the ladder that the angels were ascending and descending, the place where Jacob came back after coming back from uh, Laban's property with his wives, the place where he built an altar and called it the house of God. That city, that's the Bethel, 
that Jeroboam the first bought, built the golden calf in. And in the book of Hosea, it is called Beth Avon. Bethel is the house of God. Beth Avon is the house of wickedness. And in Hosea, God helps us to see where his people have devolved into the place where it should have been the house of God. Instead, it was the house of wickedness. In Jonah, we are going to see a synopsis of the book of Jonah. Again, you're familiar with it. He's probably the best known of the 12, <laughs> the minor prophets, but he's probably also one of the least understood because we get so caught up in a whale story that it becomes almost fictional. Um, the story of, of Jonah is an amazing picture. It's a mirror that reflects back, not just, not only do we have in the book of Jonah an opportunity to look into the heart of um, the complacency and the pharisaical uh, attitude that God's blessings are for me and for me only, but we also see in Jonah's lifetime a picture of God's people, specifically of Israel. And we can track through each of Jonah's actions, we can track it to the nation of Israel and how they responded to God and to God's call upon them. To the point that Jesus is going to affirm for us that the time spent in a whale by a prophet named Jonah was not fiction at all, but in fact was a prophecy that was going that Jesus used to confront the, the Pharisees of his day to say that the only uh, sign that they were going to receive that he was indeed the Messiah was going to be the sign of Jonah. We need to know that the sign of Jonah was not just being swallowed by a whale, but it was being spit out by a whale, having come from the bowels of death alive. And in that um, I, I, I don't know what to say except coming from death to life in that resurrection, if you will, if that uh, deliverance out of uh, the grave, out of the belly of a whale, was enough to impact the audience that heard it. They saw a man who was dead and now is alive, and that message was received and embraced, and repentance was the result of it. And what we see is that picture that Jesus used to be an illustration to the uh, pharisaical attitude of rejecting the Messiah because he wasn't what they expected him to be is in fact a prophecy of the fact that God's people will be um, more prone to have deaf ears and blind eyes and hard hearts to the very gospel message of grace and mercy, which requires repentance and humility, whereas the gentle, gen, <laughs> gentle, they're not gentle at all, but they're Gentiles. But the Gentile audience will have hearts that we, will be pierced when they hear the message of mercy and grace that's available to them and to turn from their wicked ways and to accept the mercy offered by, by God and the grace is a testimony not just about God's grace and love for all of mankind, but a stark reminder to God's people that we dare not take the blessing of God on our life as intended just for my own personal consumption and my own personal comfort. Um, what we see in Jonah is this living lesson, this living history lesson that is a portrait of all of us. If we are not willing to be humble, to acknowledge our need to repent, and to allow God to be God. Because through them all, we're going to see a sovereign, powerful, present God who is ever not, not just wanting us to know who he is and how he works, but wanting us to respond to him in the humility that acknowledges our need for a savior. So Hosea will demonstrate for us how the pagans respond to the gospel message. It will demonstrate for us the prophet's response and how God's people can become so um, self-centered and so um, blinded by their own call for personal mercy and personal grace that for it to be extended to someone else is an affront. And then we will finally wrap it all up tonight by looking at how God responds to prophets who are reluctant, to prophets who are so self-centered that 
for them to have a view of a God who is gracious and full of mercy and is so um, filled with hesed, loving kindness, that he can extend mercy to someone else that doesn't take away from the mercy he's given us. That, in fact, our God is a big, big God. That's where we're going to go tonight. So, are you ready? Are you? Do um, you have your fast hearing ears on? Because what I want us to start, and let's, let's turn to the book of Hosea. We're just going to look at a few pictures in Hosea that help us to understand the heart of God. I want us to see tonight how big, how great, how good, how sovereign our God is. And the book of Hosea is one of the best places to see it. So turn with me to chapter 1. And I'm just going to read the first two verses. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry an adulterous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So, Mar uh, so he married Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam. I've already talked about the price that was going to be required of this prophet when he was told to go marry an adulterous wife. And here in the first verses of his book, God helps us to see why he would put Hosea in such a, just a miserable situation. Uh, uh, just a never-ending relationship of heartache and disappointment and um, brokenheartedness. To love someone who doesn't love you is hard. To love someone who blatantly uh, parades their unfaithfulness in your face, not just personally but publicly, is just almost unthinkable. And that's exactly what God asked Hosea to do. Because Hosea says that's how his people treat him. Whoa. How much does God want us to understand how seriously our sin is offensive to him? And as Jonah said, as we read earlier, how it deprives us of the very grace God intends us to have. So the call to Hosea, go marry an adulterous wife. And immediately the scripture says, so he married Gomer. One of the things I really was thinking I wanted to do tonight was to compare uh, not just Jonah and Hosea, but I wanted to compare how we respond to God. But no time for that. So just do it on your own. As we go through this, think of it on your own. Uh, Hosea is called to a lifelong uh, relationship of heartache. Um, Jonah is called to just go to Nineveh. Hosea gets, immediately responds by going to marry Gomer. Let's look now, turn now to chapter 3, and let's read verses 1 through 3. Um, the, in the intervening times, and we'll, and we'll come back to chapter 2 as we look at the names of the children, but um, in the uh, intervening narrative between chapter 1 and chapter 3, we get the story of Gomer's uh, persistent and public betrayal of her husband and her lovers until she is finally put up on the auction, on the auction block um, to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. And we in our culture can't even begin to understand the humility and the degradation that that would have been for anyone, um, a Hebrew woman that has been put up to be sold as a slave uh, because she has been brought down to that uh, level is just almost hard for us to grasp. And yet it was the reality for, for Gomer and Hosea. And that's where we pick up in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. Then I told her, You are to live with me many days. 
You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. God told Hosea, go marry a prostitute. Hosea marries Gomer. Gomer plays the prostitute until she is to the place of being offered on an auction block. And God says, go, show your love to her the way I show my love. And in that transaction, Hosea obediently goes and he offers up what has, had to have been the winning bid for his wife, Gomer. Was it the only bid? I don't know. But he offers the winning bid, and the scripture breaks it down and says that it was silver. And if we go back to um, Exodus, we begin to understand that silver is used consistently throughout scripture as a picture of the price of salvation. And God instructs Hosea, go buy her from the auction block and show her the love that I show to my people. That he has paid the price to bring us, the New, the New uh, Testament tells us, do you not know that you have been bought with a price? Peter tells us that we were not bought with silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Savior. And here Hosea is giving us a picture clear back um, in the time of Jeroboam II of what God is willing to do for his people as he brings us back. And the the amazing thing, so I bought her. The same picture that we have of salvation through the minor prophets, Hosea, Jonah, and all the other ten. We have this growing picture of redemption that is going to be provided by God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, who will be for us the silver, who will provide for us the payment that brings us back, although we, like Gomer, get called and caught and distracted and pulled away time and time again by the idols of our life. That was just free. That was editorial. That was, that was beyond where I was going to go. But I want us to back up again and go back now to chapter 2 because God is giving graphic pictures in the first uh, two and three chapters of Hosea. And then the remainder of the, of the book is going to be Hosea's then message to the to the people about how grievously they have sinned against God and how greatly he has demonstrated his love for them. But one of the best pictures, one of the best summaries that we have of how God is responding to the sin of his people, his covenant people, the ten tribes of Israel who comprise the northern kingdom, are by the names of God instructs Hosea to give to his children. And it's amazing as we look at these three names, how they speak to, and you'll notice as we read about it, they're going to speak about the coming judgment, the judgment that is already coming uh, because the people have reached the limit of their sin. What I need to say now, because I may not have time to say it later, is what we need to understand is the judgment that is, is uh, predicted by all of the prophets to God's people is not, um, is not a, intended to be a sledgehammer for his people. It's intended to be an invitation to come back, to recognize. Most of the, of the prophets will be prophesying about a done deal. Judgment is coming but because the sin has reached this level. Corporately and collectively, the judgment is going to be meted out to Israel. But God is going to give promises to counterbalance that. But the message of the prophet is to the individuals. To the individuals within that culture, within that community, within that uh, group of people to say, you are going to be accountable personally and individually. You need to take stock right now of how you're handling what's happening. And I think it's important for us to, to think through that as we look at these names that God is. Uh, so turn first to um, chapter 1, verse 4. God, m most writers that I read seem to indicate that uh, Hosea had received the um, the instructions for these names long before the children were even conceived, that God had told him, go take a wife, 
and have children by her, and that the names were already given, indicating that the judgments that are contained in these names were already a part of the plan that was going to lay out. But we need to also put in, tuck into this, is that don't miss for half a second as we look at God's prediction through his prophet, through his prophet that judgment is coming, is that he's also at the very same place leaving open that window that says it is in judgment, it is in trials, it is in hard times when hope can, best, can be um, grasped. It is in those times when we think that there is no other place that we turn to God and we call upon him. And just like Jonah in the whale, <laughs> we call upon the God who hears our cry. And the message of, of the uh, prophets is don't waste this opportunity. Take it and take it quickly. So turn with me to um, chapter 1, verse Four. I'm going to start at three. Read three through four. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call him, this is the firstborn, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. This firstborn son of Gomer's, Hosea, Hosea's is, God says, name him Jezreel. Jezreel means scattered. It means that punishment is coming. The judgment has already been uh, decided. It's, it's on its way. And so this little boy is running around, and every time his father calls him, he's reminded, God says judgment is coming. My people who have been called to come to this place that was promised to Abraham all the hundreds of years ago, they're going to be scattered. They're no longer going to be in the place where God has called them to be. Jezreel says, your time in this place is limited. There's not, um, there's not going to be an opportunity to stay where you are. Then he has a second child, this one a little girl. Read about her. In chapter 3, verse 6, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her name Lo-Ruhamah, which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them, not by bow or sword or battle or by horses or horsemen, but I, the Lord, their God, will save them. So this little girl is born, and her name is not loved. God says, I will no longer love the ten tribes of Israel, but I will still love Judah. I will not keep Assyria from coming and taking captive the ten northern tribes, but I will keep Judah from being taken by Assyria. And God does that. We know the history, how uh, they circle around during the time of Hezekiah, and God sovereignly intervenes, and Assyria is called off. It won't be, Judah won't be taken captive by Assyria. It will fall to Babylon. But here, God says through Hosea, through Hosea, name your little girl not loved, because my people no longer love me. I do not love Israel anymore. Ooh, that's hard for us to, to think through because we think about the unconditional loving kindness of God. But I want you to see what he's talking about is he's talking about this re relational love that was called as a covenant people, that when they turned their back on him, they were demonstrating they did not love God. And that's going to be really clearly delineated in the next name. But we need to understand that God is responding according to the way the people have responded to him. And we know that our God is not capricious or arbitrary, that he is only giving to the people what they have already decided themselves is where they want to be. Does that make any sense? So let's go to the fourth name, Lo-Ami. That's in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. After she had weaned Lo-Rumaha, 
Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo-Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. If you have a, an NIV, you might look at the footnote on um, the last portion of that name. You are not my people, and I am not your God. The footnote on NIV translates, I am not your I am just breaks your heart to think about God who has faithfully and lovingly brought and protected his children out of Egypt. And Hosea is going to delineate that relationship with um, Israel, how God brought them out of Egypt to himself, how he cared for them and protected them. And he was the I am who showed himself superior over all the gods of Egypt. And now they are in the promised land and they have turned to the idols that are... um, from their neighboring countries. They're turning to the idol that came with them in their heart from Egypt. And he says, name this child, lo on me, because you're not my people, because I am not your God. Just let, let that tug at your heart until you, you begin to understand it's not just the 10 northern tribes. Judah is going to go the same way. And you and I have gone the same way in our choices over and over again. But on the heels of all of these prom- all of these judgment declarations by the names, God is on the heels, going to turn around and say, you have rejected me. You have not loved me. You will be scattered as a result of the consequences of your own choices and your loyalties. But I remain the same. Look at back in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. This is still um, in that uh, same time frame. He has just given the names of the children. And can you imagine Hosea saying, this is, this is not only have to live with a wife that doesn't love me, but now my children are constant reminders of what the consequences of a rebellious people of which I am a part, what that life is like. And God comes back in verse 10 of chapter 1, and he says, Yet the Israelites, listen to this, even though they will be scattered, they are not loved, they're not my people, they will be like the sand on the seashore. Do you remember that? That's the Abrahamic covenant. They will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted, in the place, in the place where it was said of them, You are not my people. They will be called children of the living God. On the heels of the judgment on the sin of God's people, Israel, God says, you are not faithful, but I am a covenant-keeping God. I made a covenant to Abraham that is irrevocable. And in this place where you have turned your back on me, where you have rejected me, where you are not allowing me to be your I am, where you are not allowing me to be your God. In this same place, I will fulfill my vow, my, com- my covenant to Abraham. In this place, there will be not only a nation that will be as numerous as the sands, but they will be called the children of the living God. It's one of the most amazing things about the minor prophets is judgment is imminent, but God has a plan for that day. The nation of Israel will uh, be uh, scattered through all the world, but there will be a day when he will bring them back. And in that place, they will be called the children of the living God because they will call him their God. Read chapter 2 now, verse 23. Oh, Chapter 2, verse 23, God says, I will plant her for myself in the land. This is in direct response to the name Jezreel, where he says, I will scatter them. Here he says, I will plant her in, for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one who is not loved, to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, You are my people, and they will say, 
you are my God. You are my God. Our God, later on, and I, and I didn't have time to include it in where we're going, but he, he says, I, I am not like man. I am God. You guys are fickle. You make a promise, and you don't even remember it, and then you turn away from me, and you completely disregard me. But I am not like you. I am the covenant-making. I am the covenant-keeping God. And the promises I've made are the promises I will keep. And the offer for us individually is we, everyone, has an opportunity to turn to God, to recognize our need for him, not just because we were saved when we were 6 or 86, but because every day we need to call upon a God who loves us and takes care of us. So the children's names brought judgment, but they also brought hope that God was a God who keeps his promises. That's where we want to look real quickly at the promises God makes to his children who are the unfaithful wife that um, Gomer illustrates for Hosea. In chapter 3, verse 4, uh, God makes an amazing promise through his prophet Hosea. He says, For the Israelites will live many days without kings or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. They will be scattered. They will be scattered then through the Assyrian uh, captivity. Judah will be scattered into Babylon for 70 years. Um, In AD 70, they will be scattered again out of Jerusalem. And there will be no temple. There will be no priest. There will be no sacrifices. That's where we live today in a time when God's people are um, are without a king, they are without a priest, they are without sacrifice, they are without sacred stones, they are without an ephod, they are without household gods. But look at verse 5 of chapter 3. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. The promise God has made in his covenant is that he is the covenant-making, keeping God. And in the last days, although Israel turned her back on both her God in the old covenant and the Messiah in the New Testament, God says, I am the God who honors my promises. And in the last day, my people will not only be planted in the land, they will be brought back in love, and they will be called my children in those days. Is that, is that exciting? Look at how it's going to happen, though. In chapter 5, verses 15 through chapter 6, verse 3, God tells us how this is going to happen. He says, I will return again to my place. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. And in their distress, earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us so that he may heal us. He has struck us down so that he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. God says, in in that day, my people will seek me. And I not only will be found, but I will come to them. And when they come to me, they will acknowledge their guilt. They will seek my face. And in their distress, they will eagerly seek me. And in that process, they will return. On the heels of that, I want us to keep that in mind when we revisit Jonah in a whale. But before we leave Hosea, turn with me to the last chapter, chapter 14, verses 1 through 2. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. 
say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. On that day, God will bring back his people because collectively as a nation, they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will declare that he is Lord and they will recognize their sin. But individually, the invitation is open to all people at all times to return to the Lord God of Israel that we can take our words of confession and repentance to him and he will receive us all, all the time. That's the God of Hosea. That's the God who loves us and is offering us and inviting us into a relationship of restoration. Then we go to Jonah, the familiar story that you all know. So we're not going to talk about him in the, in, the, in the belly of the whale except for a minute. So turn to Jonah, and let's look at how Jonah, the reluctant prophet, relates to pagans. He's called to go to the heathen capital of Nineveh, of, of Assyria, which is Nineveh. If Assyria was strong and a world power for up to six to eight hundred years, Nineveh was the strongest city and probably the most powerful city historically of any um, that has ever known the world, according to historians that I read. And so for God to send Jonah to this capital of the world, which was a capital not just militarily, not just monetarily, not just um, in wickedness and sin, but was the target of God's grace and mercy and compassion. Amazing message. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Have we heard this name before in 2 Kings? Came to Jonah, son of Amity. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed from Tarshish to flee from the Lord. We know the story, how he goes to sleep in the bottom of a ship, and God provides a great storm. And the sailors, who are pagan from all the nations around, are doing their best to survive the storm. Finally, they go down and ask Jonah, wake up. Maybe you can talk to your God. Our gods, our gods aren't answering. And Jonah is asked who he serves, and he tells them that I serve the God of heaven, the God who made the heaven, the seas, and the earth. And these sailors do their very best, pagan sailors who do not know this God, do their very best to preserve Jonah's life. Jonah finally says, the only way you're going to be saved is to throw me over. And before they throw Jonah over the edge into his death in the sea, they pray to the God of Jonah and ask for forgiveness. Pagans who respond to the God of Jonah with more grace and more mercy than the prophet who is called to take a message about who his God is. So we know Jonah is thrown into the sea. God provided the storm, then he calms the storm. God provides a fish who swallows the reluctant prophet. In the belly of the fish, Jonah responds in an amazing prayer of repentance and forgiveness and, and acknowledgement of who God is. He says, I, in my distress, I called out and you answered me. From the depths of the pit, you have delivered me. And then God caused the fish to vomit Jonah out. From the pit of death to a resurrected new life, we have Jonah now walking. And that's where we pick up in verse 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. 
Catch this. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And a few of them, one or two of them, all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. The king of Nineveh, the king of Assyria, the most powerful man in all the world at that time, heard the message of the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and recognized his need to be saved. God's people had had covenant since Abraham, and they had chosen the trinkets of the world. The king of Nineveh got off his throne, took off his robes, and knelt before the God who alone could bring not just salvation, but peace. Wow, that is amazing, is it not? Um, the prophet who was sent to preach repentance sees repentance, and how does he respond? <laughs> Let's read about it. <laughs> Let's read about it in chapter 4. Of Jonah. But to Jonah, because of course God withheld, he relented from sending judgment because the king had gotten off his throne, because the king had stripped himself of his robes, because the king had put on sackcloth and called all of his people to cry out to the only God who could give forgiveness and salvation. Verse 1 of chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, just take my life away, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah, who had cried for mercy in the belly of a whale, was delivered mercifully to carry the message of repentance to a nation who did not know God. And he who received mercy he who received mercy was angry that mercy could be extended anywhere else. This is the message Jesus used to the Pharisees in Matthew. Lest we say they are selfish and self-centered, we need to stop and look at ourselves and say, do I feel like if God is blessing someone else, somehow it's taking away from mine? That's where Jonah was. He said, I knew what kind of a God you were, and I don't like that kind of a God. God's not finished with him yet. Turn to chapter 4, verse 4. God speaks to him. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? We will finish up this portion of my contribution to these Wednesday night studies by revisiting the questions that God asks to his people. He asked, has asked questions from the garden to Jonah, and he will continue to ask them. And they're never questions that he doesn't have answers for. They're questions that he wants us to answer for ourselves to reveal to ourselves both who we are and who he is. So God speaks to Jonah and says, is it right for you to be angry? Let's go ahead and read on. 
in verses 5 through 9. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. We always have to be careful when we make ourselves shelters, you know? It's just not a good thing. He made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and, it made, and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade to his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching west east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, it absolutely is. I am so angry, I wish I was dead. God responds in verse 10. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Should I not have concern for that great city of Nineveh? Jonah's story as a minor prophet ends with that question. He doesn't answer it, nor does God expound upon it. Because this really is the question that God offers to us. Should I not be concerned about the people I created in my image to be filled with my spirit so that they could become my workmanship, created to do good things planned beforehand? Through the minor prophets of Hosea and Jonah, we see the heart of God, a God who loves his people, who, a God who loves them unconditionally and will seek after them, build up hedges to keep them to himself, woo them back, and buy them off of an auction block because he is God and not man, because he loves as only God can love. And he has a heart for his people who are called by his name to be called into obedience to that name. But a God who cares deeply about his people. In Jonah, we see the picture of a God who loves the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his son that all who believe on him Ninevite, Medfordite, all who believe upon him should never perish, but should live with eternal life. And the God whom we serve, the God whom we call upon, both as Father and as Lord and as Savior, says, should I not be concerned for a nation that should be called Christian, but has turned their back on me? Should I not be concerned about a world who is filled with idols made by hands and thereby missing out on the grace that I would offer them? Should I not care? And the answer rings in our hearts and through our hands and feet. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your loving kindness. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your ongoing, continuing message to tell us how great and awesome, how sovereign and perfect is your plan of redemption. How patient you are to continually work with us as reluctant children 
called by your name. Father, I pray that for your glory, for your glory, that we would call upon your name in forgiveness. And Father, that we would be obedient to be all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.